Good evening, everybody. Um, um, when Professor Peter Davison died just over a year ago, uh, Ron Bateman, who was one of our founding members and was on the original committee, suggested that since every serious person involved with studying Orwell and researching Orwell has rested on the shoulders of Professor Peter Davison, it would be appropriate for us to create a Peter Davison Award to recognise people who've done uh, original or sustained research um, on Orwell in, in the tradition that Peter uh, exemplified. And I'm delighted tonight to be making the first award somewhat um, handicapped because the physical piece of award has been lost by UPS in America somewhere. Um, but that won't won't hold us up because we will still make the make the award. The uh, person who thinks that I've sent Rebecca to give him something uh, that I gave to her to pass on, Peter. Um, I'm afraid I told you a porky because I didn't want to tell you in advance that you are the first winner of the Peter Davison Award in recognition of the fact that, in effect, you created all world studies with your, your work with your colleague Abrams in, in the early days, and you continued right up to this year. You published another book, uh, and I know you don't stop, and I know from the quality of questions that you ask our various speakers that you're still wholly engaged in Orwell and Orwell studies. Congratulations. Rebecca, did you did you print the uh, thing? Yeah, oh. I must say I'm quite, I'm almost crying. I'm, I'm, I'm quite overwhelmed. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, Peter Davison was, was, uh, whom I don't think I ever actually met, although we were together in the 1984 con uh, meeting at, at the Library of Congress. But of course, uh, his his it may, uh, his twenty volume magnificent edition uh, made it possible to for me to write the little book. So I'm 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 deeply honored, touched, overwhelmed. And uh, extremely, extremely honoured. Well, uh, we're by this. delighted that Peter's sons in uh, Cardiff and in uh, South Island, New Zealand, are here with us today as well. Uh, before before we made the you know decided to go ahead with the the award, we sought their blessing and uh, they were delighted to give it. Could could you just hold? that printed off one so that our members can see what what it, it is it's on slate it's a lovely picture of peter that peter davison that is that that uh, his sons gave us uh and it shows recognition and uh, we, we will award this annually or not annually depending on who we feel warrants like peter did uh to be awarded this this uh very prestigious award in recognition of all the work they've done. Congratulations. Can you all unmute and congratulate Peter? And thank, you very, and thank you very much, Rebecca. Yes, it was wonderful that she came. I'm deeply honoured. And I brought him these dahlias because we oh, had to have beautiful. physical. And I'm sure I'll come back with the plaque when it turns up. Yes. Uh, going to be a uh, plaque? Yes. This is just a oh, presentation well. of the plaque that's somewhere in the, the UPS system. Oh, I see. <laughs> so, yeah. that, 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 it's, it's printed on slate. Um, 
you, 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 you've seen our, our uh, Barnhill slate. Uh, oh, yeah, from Barnhill? No, no, no. No, it's not not from no, Barnhill. But the same slate. The same, same quote. Of the slate, yes. I, I see. I see. It's, it's actually Welsh slate rather than Scots slate. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there we are. Thank so, you so much. Thank you very much uh, for all you've done for all of us who who are. It's been my great pleasure, and it is wonderful. This community is so terrific. Well, we 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 said goodbye to Dione on Friday, um, which was a very beautiful service. And, yes, and, and, it was and, recorded. I, I and I watched it after the fact, so it was very good, moving and good. We we gave her a good and proper send off, and uh, I'm pleased to see you bought not all those roses, but his dahlias. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, I think we should move on now to uh, tonight's George talk which very fittingly, since it is about uh, the teaching of 1984, that it is being presented by Felicia Nimu Ackerman, who uh, is a senior academic at Brown University, which of course proudly looks after the, um, the fact what, what is available to the rest of us as a facsimile edition of 1984. So over to you, Felicia. Thank you very much. I would like to start by saying how delighted I am that Peter Stansky has won this award. I met Peter when we were both fellows at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences in 1988-89. We had some very nice talks about Orwell. Then 35 years later, when I was teaching 1984, I found that I really could not teach the final encounter between Winston and Julia without getting all choked up, which I thought inhibited class critical discussion. I emailed Peter, asked him if he remembered me and if he could give me any advice. He emailed me back immediately, giving me his phone number and telling me to call him up. I thought that was incredibly generous. I wasn't even sure if he would remember me. So because of his generosity and the wonderful work he does, I really I'm sure the cat. Okay, the trend on uh, the Things that have been posted, you'll be getting. <laughs> this talk is called Teaching the 20th Century's Most Underrated Novel, and it's a very expanded version of what will be my contribution to the Modern Language Association's anthology called Approaches to Teaching the Writings of George Orwell, but they have a strict length limit. Okay. When push came to shove, his terror killed love and decency too. Would this befall you? When I teach 1984 in my philosophy classes at Brown University, I begin by saying that it is the 20th century's most underrated novel. This captures students' attention. Usually about two-thirds of them have read the book earlier. Virtually all have heard of it. They know it is a mainstay of discussions about politics and society, and that the author's name has been incorporated into the language through the common adjective Orwellian. Most have often encountered such words and phrases as thought police, news speak, and Big Brother is watching you. Even the book's title has symbolic significance. How could such a book count as underrated, I ask them. <coughs> Many say they have no idea. Others say the book's warning about a surveillance state and a government's lies and attempts to control speech are undervalued. These students maintain that Orwell's warning still rings true. Some are receptive when I suggest there is a vast difference between a society where a fanatically loyal party functionary gets slated for torture because his seven-year-old daughter denounces him for saying, down with Big Brother in his sleep, and a society where bumper stickers calling for the president's downfall are openly sold online and the media routinely call attention to government duplicity. Other students object that I am underestimating the dangers we face in America. Just a minute, I'll take you a drink of water, sorry. 
This leads to lively discussions along familiar lines. Although these discussions often illustrate the one-sidedness of students at my very liberal university. For example, few of my students have been concerned that the Let's Move campaign of former First Lady Michelle Obama was stigmatizing fat people, and none have ever endorsed fear that this campaign indicated a danger that Americans would one day be subjected to a daily regimen of physical jerks, where the government would watch and supervise them performing exercises of their own. Discussion gets less predictable when I describe the two ways in which I consider the book underrated. One is simply that, although highly rated, it is not rated highly enough. For example, two major best book lists rank 1984 below a 20th century dystopian novel with which it is often discussed in tandem, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. The Modern Library Editorial Board's list of the 20th century's best novels in English ranks Brave New World fifth and 1984 13th. The Le Mans list of the 100 best books of the 20th century, which is not limited to English language books or to novels, ranks Brave New World 21st and 1984 22nd. As I said in a review of still another book, Happiness, a History by Darren McMahon, the review was in Washington Post, Post Book World, I consider Brave New World basically a screed with cardboard characters contrived to illustrate the debatable supposition that in a society where everything is pleasurable, life is bound to revolve around superficial sensory thrills, mindless entertainment, and horror of horrors material consumption. The two lists underrate Orwell's masterpiece in a way that is relatively mild, though. Much more severe is the sort of underrating that goes as far back as Orville Prescott's 1949 review. Prescott says the book, quote, is not impressive as a novel about particular human beings, close quote, and that the love affair between Winston and Julia, quote, is stiff and of little interest. What makes 1984 a terrible and important book is its exposure of the final goal of absolute totalitarianism. This is a book to haunt your sleep, close quote. Prescott's reaction is extreme, but its underlying idea is hardly unusual. Discussions of the book intensifying in America after the political ascendancy of the previous occupant of the White House, whose name I avoid uttering, have generally focused on its political side, sometimes barely treating it as a novel at all. No one would guess from such discussions that 1984 gives a riveting and heartbreaking portrayal of two indelibly well-developed individuals whose new love affairs can change readers' lives by permanently and devastatingly ending their illusions about love and thus haunt their sleep in ways that go far beyond the political. I tell students that Prescott is hardly alone in deprecating the love between Winston and Julia. I discuss Cass Sunstein's view that Julia emerges, quote, as less a person than an adolescent male fantasy, close quote. I point out that Winston's fantasy about Julia hardly included what he comes to admire as her, quote, great acuteness, close quote, about sex, nor is his admiration for this acuteness compatible with his seeing her purely as a sex object. I call attention to his admiration for her acuteness in non-sexual areas as well. He is aware that, quote, in some ways she was far more acute than Winston and far less susceptible to party propaganda. Once when he happened in some connection to mention the war in Eurasia, she startled him by saying casually that in her opinion, the war was not happening. <clears throat> this was an idea that literally had never occurred to him. She also stirred a sort of envy in him by telling him that during the two minutes hate, her great difficulty was to avoid bursting out laughing, close quote. He also admiringly recognizes that she, quote, obviously had a practical cunning which she lacked, close quote. Her additional insights include, quote, if you kept the small birds, you could break the big ones, close quote. None of this fits a stereotypical adolescent male fantasy or was part of Winston's pre-meeting pre fantasies about Julia. 
I suggest that Juliet and Winston's relationship is almost ideal, or at least almost as close to ideal as is possible in their repressive and perilous circumstances. They have a tremendous mutual physical attraction and a tremendous mutual me mental attraction as well. They sit, quote, talking for hours, close quote. They appreciate each other's complementary strengths. When Julia tells Winston, I'm not interested in the next generation, dear. I'm interested in us, close quote. He replies, you're only a rebel from the waist downwards, close quote. Whereupon, quote, she fought this brilliantly witty and flung her arms round him in delight, close quote. My feminist students often take umbrage at Winston's rape and murder, murder fantasy about Julia, as well as at the fact that he, quote, dislike nearly all women and especially the young and pretty ones, close quote. I suggest that the former, that is the fantasy, can be partially explained in terms of Winston's sexual attraction to Julia, as well as in terms of his general hostility toward the party's adherence. And the latter, his dislike of women, can be explained by partly by the fact that, quote, it was always the women and above all the young and pretty ones, uh, the young ones, sorry, who were the most bigoted adherents of the party, the followers of slogans, the anitor spies, and dozers out of orthodoxy, close quote. But the book contains a sexist line that is impossible, I think, to explain away. Upon awakening after sleep, following a bout of lovemaking, quote, he pulled the overalls aside and studied her smooth white flank. In the old days, he thought, a man looked at a girl's body and saw that it was desirable, and that was the end of the story, close quote. Objection to Winston's nostalgia here are too obvious to dwell upon, but Orwell's apparent endorsement of this nostalgia mars the, book moral vision, mars the book's moral vision, although in my opinion, not very deeply. Far more interesting is Julia's inability to grasp some of Winston's deepest concerns. Unlike him, quote, she only questioned the teachings of the party when they in some way touched upon her own life. Often she was ready to accept the official mythology simply because the difference between truth and falsehood did not seem important to her. She did not feel the abyss opening beneath her feet at the thought of lies becoming truths, close quote. So their relationship is not quite perfect. But I ask my students, what relationship is perfect? Sorry, I'm taking another drink of water. Brief pause. I suggest that the overwhelming impression is that Winston and Julia find, quote, paradise, close quote, in their hideaway, and their love is transformative for him. As Orwell says, quote, Winston has had dropped the habit of drinking gin at all hours. He seemed to have lost the need for it. He had grown fatter. His varicose ulcer had subsided, leaving only a brown stain on the skin above his ankle. His fits of coughing in the early morning had stopped. The process of his life had seemed to be intolerable. He no longer had any impulse to make faces at the telescreen or shout curses at the top of his voice. Close quote. His attitude toward his fellow humans also changes. As Orwell tells us, quote, for the first time in his life, he did not despise the probes or think of them merely as an inert force which would one day spring to life and regenerate the world. The probes had stayed human. They had not become hardened inside. They had held on to the primitive emotions which he himself had to relearn by conscious effort. And in relearning this, he remembered how a few weeks ago he had seen a severed hand lying on the pavement and had kicked it into the gutter as though it had been a cabbage stalk, close quote. Having formally said, I hate goodness. I don't want any virtue to exist anywhere. I want everyone to be corrupt to the bones, close quote. He has progressed to seeing genuine goodness as something distinct from the party's notion of virtue, giving him the determination to stay human. Julia changes as well. Having initially boasted, I'm corrupt to the bones, close quote, and described her first lover's suicide to avoid arrest as, quote, a good job, otherwise they had had my name out of him, close quote. She eventually progresses to the point of reassuring Winston that the party could not destroy their love because, quote, they can't get inside you, close quote. 
Moreover, despite Julia's initial belief that sexual fulfillment precludes political fervor, their love affair turns out to fuel their involvement in the, in the perhaps apocryphal, apocryphal, I always mispronounce that, brotherhood opposing the party, although their refusal to separate and never meet again limits what they agree to do. Even successive rounds of torture cannot eradicate Winston's love for Julia. That is why he ends up in room 101 to be confronted with, quote, something unendurable, something that cannot be contemplated. I also introduced students to Noah Berlatsky's dismissive feminist view. Sorry, more water. He says, George Orwell's handling of his main female character in 1984 is cliched, clumsy, and not a little sexist. Julia is treated as a tool for women happiness rather than a person in her own right. Sexism prevents their love from being a real love affair, which is why the state can break it apart. Close quote. I invite students to assess this claim in relation to what actually happens in Room 101. Quote, For an instant he was insane, a screaming animal, yet he came out of the blackness clutching an idea. There was one and only one way to save him. He must impose another human being, the body of another human being, <coughs> from the rats. He had suddenly understood that in the whole world, there was just one person to whom he could transfer his punishment, one body that he could trust between himself and the rats. And he was shouting frantically over and over, do it to Julia, do it to Julia, not me, Julia. I don't care what you do to her, tear her face off, strip her to the phones, not me, Julia, not me, close quote. At their final meeting, Julia and recognize, Winston and Julia recognize that their love is extinguished irrevocably. Consider this exchange. Quote, Sometimes, she said, they threaten you with something, something you can't stand up to, can't even think about. And then you say, don't do it to me. Do it to somebody else. Do it to so-and-so. And perhaps you might pretend afterwards that it was only a trick and that you just said it to make them stop and didn't really mean it. But that isn't true. At the time when it happens, you do mean it. You think there's no other way of saving yourself. and You're quite ready to save yourself that way. You want it to happen to the other person. You don't give a damn what they suffer. All you care about is yourself. All you care about is yourself, he echoed. And after that, you don't feel the same towards the other person any longer. No, he said. You don't feel the same, end quote. That's the party, uh, the passage I needed Peter Stansky's help in not blubbering over when I read. Okay, um, I defy my students to find a more compelling passage in all of fiction, let alone to maintain, after encountering this passage, which genuinely haunts my sleep in the sense of giving me nightmares, that, as Prescott claims, the love affair between Winston and Julia is sniff and a little interest, close quote. Moreover, students can see that sexism plays no role here, contrary to what Noah Berlatsky said. All that matters is Winston's terror of the rats and the aftermath of one's choice to sacrifice the other person, one's beloved, in order to save oneself. As Winston reflects, quote, they can't get inside you, she had said, but they could get inside you. What happens to you here is forever, O'Brien had said. That was a true word. There were things, your own acts, from which you could never recover. Something was killed inside your breast, burned out, cauterized out. How could anybody think that this is not interesting as about human beings? Rats are Winston's individual and idiosyncratic breaking point, but it is essential to Orwell's vision that everyone would be prone to Winston's capitulation in Room 101 because... Quote, for everyone, there is something unadorable, something that cannot be contemplated. I asked students to consider the following conditions that would be necessary for this to be true. And these are the conditions that Chris has kindly posted for you to look at. But I'll read them anyway. Condition one, all people believe on some level, which need not include conscious awareness, that there was there is someone or something they would not sacrifice in order to save themselves from even the greatest horror. Condition two, this universal belief is universally false. Condition three, once you have made the sacrifice, 
you don't feel the same towards the other person or other object of your allegiance any longer. Aftermath, your allegiance can now be directed to something else. I suggest that Orwell is setting forth a drastic view that is completely independent of political suppression and the surveillance state. The view that everyone's greatest allegiance is founded on self-deception and would end if the self-deception were dispelled. Unsurprisingly, many students have find the three conditions hard to assess. Give me a moment, please. But some mm. argue that a realistic or as they often put it, healthy love, does not involve the belief that you would put your beloved first no matter what horrors you were threatened with. Some also suggest that with therapy, you could recover from your own act of throwing the beloved to the, your beloved to the rats in order to save yourself. When I ask whether you can have this self-knowledge at the forefront of your mind in your daily dealings with your beloved, let alone in your romantic and erotic dealings, some students reply, why should you? They are often surprised when I say this means they are endorsing Orwell's view that love depends on self-deception. In this context, it is important to focus on Winston's agency in Room 101. Orwell offers accounts that at first blush may seem inconsistent. On one hand, Orwell O'Brien sorry, tells Winston, Things will happen to you from which you could not recover if you lived a thousand years. This makes Winston sound passive, as though his agency will not be involved. On the other hand, I have quoted the passage in which Winston reflects about his performance in Room 101. There were things, your own acts, for which you could not recover. You could never recover. How can we re reconcile these two apparently conflictive views of Winston's agency? One of O'Brien's speeches to Winston suggests a way, quote, for everyone, there is something unendurable, something that cannot be contemplated. Courage and cowardice are not, not cowardly to clutch at a rope. If you are coming up from deep water, it is not cowardly to fill your lungs with air. It is merely an instant which cannot be destroyed. It is the same with the rats. For you, they are unendurable. They are a form of pressure that you cannot withstand, even if you wish to. You will do what is required of you. Close quote. Are rats really a form of pressure that Winston could not withstand, even if he wished to? Perhaps, but not if he wished to more than he wished anything else at the time. O'Brien's speech here offers a way of reconciling the book's two seemingly contradictory views of Winston's agency by recognizing that coercion relies on the values that underlie a person's choices, including choices made frantically under intense pressure that is far too extreme to allow deliberation, and that, although seeming compelled, these choices are still, as Winston reflects, your own acts arising from your own frantic choices and priorities at the moment. Obviously, the sort of therapy some students mention as possibly helpful after this betrayal would hardly be available in Oceania. What is available in Oceania? Doublethink. Doublethink, quote, the power of holding two contradictory ideas in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them, close quote, is a force of repression in Oceania. In principle, however, it could be a force of liberation as well. It could enable Winston to accept, to accept simultaneously the possibly contradictory ideas that on the one hand he loves Julia, and on the other hand he has betrayed her and presumably would do so again. That is why Winston's love for Julia rather than being supplemented by a contradictory idea in a manifestation of doublethink, must be, quote, burned out, cauterized out, close quote, just as heresy will be burned out, cauterized out, once new speak is fi fully established, quote, making all non-Orthodox modes of thought impossible, quote, quote. In fact, as the Duke's philologist sign points out to Winston, quote, there will be no thought as we understand it now. Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness, close quote. 
A novel set in a society that has completed this transformation could hardly be impressive as a novel about particular human beings. This does not keep Winston and Julia from burning bright as two of the most enduring and compelling characters literature has ever produced. Furthermore, I call students' attention to the con I call students' attention to the contrast between Winston's claim about what does and doesn't matter and his acknowledgement that what you say or do sometimes does matter, as in the episode where his mother clasps his dying sister in her arms because, quote, if you loved someone, you loved him, and when you had nothing else to give, you still gave him love, close quote. Love is hardly the only area where considering the non-political side of 1984 opens up new perspectives on life both inside and outside the book. My courses also discuss the book's attitude toward physical appearance. This gripping and complex facet of the book has su received surprisingly little attention. At the outset, Winston's attitude is entirely conventional. He regards, quote, swollen waddling, quote, pro women as, quote, monstrous, close quote, and is revolted when a prostitute turns out to be, quote, quite an old woman, 50 years old at least, close quote, with the, quote, truly dreadful, close quote, defect of having, quote, no teeth at all, close quote. He craves Julia's, quote, white youthful body, close quote, and, quote, with the sense of his own inferiority heavy on him, upon him, close quote, asks her, quote, now that you've seen what I look like, what I'm really like, can you still bear to look at me, close quote. Julia, less bound by conventional aesthetics, quote, quote couldn't care less, close quote, that Winston is 13 years older than she is and has varicose veins and five false teeth. But the transformative nature of his relationship with Julia figures here, too. Here are Winston's thoughts upon contemplating a pro woman right before his capture. Quote, it had never occurred to him before that the body of a woman of 50, blown up to monstrous dimensions by childbearing, then hardened, roughened by work till it was coarse in the grain like an overripe turnip, could be beautiful. But it was so, and after all, he thought, why not? The solid, counterless body, like a block of granite, and the rasping red skin bore the same relation to the body of a girl as the rose him to the rose. Why should the fruit be held inferior to the flower? She's beautiful, he murmured. She's a meter across the hips, easily, said Julia. That is her style of beauty, said Winston. Close quote. This accords with the idea that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or, to quote one of my students, you're beautiful no matter what you look like. And he was talking about physical beauty, not beauty of character. This raises terrific issues for class discussion. One moment of taking another sip. I begin by asking students to envision someone who is four feet tall, weighs 300 pounds, and has a scarred face and a hair lip. I ask them to consider whether they think such a person would have his or her own style of beauty and whether they could be attracted to that person unless the attraction had some other basis. I stress that I respect their privacy too much to ask them to tell the class their answers. Some choose to do so, though, most of whom say they would not be attracted on physical grounds, although some add that they could love such a person despite his or her appearance. A drastically different perspective on physical appearance emerges during Winston's imprisonment. Although his impression of O'Brien's face as, quote, so ugly, close quote, does not change the fact that, quote, he had never loved him so deeply as at this moment, close quote, Winston entirely accepts the view that his own ugliness and physical deterioration have turned him into, quote, a bag of filth, close quote, unworthy of being, quote, the last man, close quote, or even being a viable human being at all. His reflection in a mirror shocks him, quote, the curvature of his spine was astonishing. The thin shoulders were hunched forward so as to make a cavity of the chest. The scraggy neck seemed to be bending double under the weight of the skull. As a guess, he would have said that it was the body of a man of 60 suffering from some malignant disease, close quote. O'Brien berates, berates Winston as follows, quote, 
look at the condition you are in. Look at this filthy grind all over your body. Look at the dirt between your toes. Look at that disgusting running sore on your leg. Do you know that you stink like a goat? Probably you have seen to notice it. Even your hair is coming out in handfuls. Look, he plucked at Winston's head and brought away a tuft of hair. Open your mouth. Nine, ten, eleven teeth left. How many had you when you came to us? And the few you have left are dropping out of your head. Look here, close quote. Winston's acceptance of this physical deterioration precludes his being, quote, the last man, the guardian of the human spirit, close quote, kicks off a class discussion of how, if at all, physical deterioration is related to human worth. When I offer the familiar slogan, beauty is skin deep, as a middle ground between the view that everyone has, quote, her style of beauty, close quote, and the dismissal of a fifth of a physically deteriorated and hideous person as unworthy to be the guardian of the human spirit, students' responses are fruitfully varied, although I have yet to encounter one who openly endorses the preposterous view that a man of 60 suffering from some malignant disease cannot be a viable human being, or for that matter, cannot be the guardian of the human spirit. In, discussing the, in addition to discussing the, view, the book's views about the body, my courses consider its view of the mind. I've already mentioned Winston's admiration for several aspects of Julia's mind. He has even greater admiration, or in fact, for O'Brien's mind. Quote, how intelligent, he thought, how intelligent. Never did O'Brien fail to understand what was said to him. Close quote. In Winston's view, quote, O'Brien was a being in all ways larger than himself. There was no idea that he had ever had or could have that O'Brien had not long ago examined and rejected. His mind contained Winston's mind. But in that case, how could it be true that O'Brien was mad? It must be he, Winston, who was mad. I urge students to contrast this with Winston's view of the pro woman who he has come to see as having, come to see as beautiful, but also as having, quote, no mind, only strong arms, a warm heart, and a fertile belly, close quote. Winston should know better since he knows that, quote, where the lottery was concerned, even people who could barely read and write seemed capable of intricate calculations and staggering feats of memory, close quote. Re Moreover, consider his recognition that the pros, quote, were not loyal to a party or a country or an idea, they were loyal to one another, close quote. I asked you to consider whether anyone could be loyal without a mind. 1984 is hardly the only place where Orwell dismisses as mindless people whose minds do not measure up to his standard. My seminars on Orwell use a selection of his essays, plus all or almost all of his novels, including Coming Up for Air, whose narrator reflects, quote, perhaps a man really dies when his brain stops, when he loses the power to take in a new idea. There are a lot of people like that, dead minds stopped inside, just moving backwards and forwards on the same little track, getting fainter and fainter all the time, like just, sorry, getting fainter all the time, like ghosts, close quotes. This writes off non-learners as not just mindless, but dead. I asked students to consider whether killing such people would really be on a par with firing bullets into corpses. Students often reply that the narrative statement should not be taken literally. But philosophy has a long history of extreme intellectual snobbishness. I ask students to consider the Socratic maxim that the unexamined life is not worth living. Despite Iris Murdoch's apt objection that, quote, an unexamined life can be virtuous, quote, quote, many present-day philosophers admire the Socratic maxim, which writes off as worthless the lives of people who choose not to examine their lives or who lack the cognitive ability to do so. Since the unexamined maxim is not worth accepting, I initiate a class discussion about the morality of a view that writes off so much of the human race. This discussion often veers into bioethics, which is one of my fields. The prominent American bioethicist and legal philosopher Ronald Dworkin imagines a person who, in the very early stages of Alzheimer's disease, signs an advanced directive stipulating, quote, that life prolonging treatment be denied him later, or that funds not be spent in maintaining him in great comfort, even if he, when demanded, pleads for it. Close quote. 
Walk in holds of these latter pleas, unlike the pleas of the Jehovah's Witness, who, when faced with a life-threatening situation, decides he wants a blood transfusion, should be overridden because severely demented people no longer have enough of the way of minds for their reversal to deserve respect. I think it's fairly obvious that anyone who is capable of pleading to be kept alive and comfortable still has a functioning mind. But Darwin's Borkin's dismissive, ableist, cognitive snobbery is not only respectable, but extremely common in bioethics. By contrast, note that Orwell is not always unsparing about what counts as a mind. In a hanging, he recognizes the ability simply to step, quote, slightly aside to avoid a puddle on the path, close quote, is sufficient to indicate someone whose death would mean, quote, one mindless, one worldless. The final topic I will discuss today is racism, a topic that does have political relevance, but is not commonly included in discussions of the political side of 1984. Despite, despite mention of the, quote, colored slaves, close quote, of, quote, Equatorial Africa or the countries of the Middle East or Southern India and the Indonesian archipelago, close quote, Orwell makes a point of saying that Oceania, Oceania lacks, quote, racial discrimination or any marked domination of one province by another. Jews, Negroes, South Americans, and pure Indian blood are to be found in the highest ranks of the party. And the administrators of any area are always drawn from the inhabitants of that area. In no part of Oceania do inhabitants have the feeling that they are a colonial population ruled from a distinct capital. Moreover, notice that none of the invective heard in Goldstein during the two minutes hate is even remotely anti-Semitic. I suggest that this ties in with the fact that inter-party membership is determined by exams taken at the age of 16. As Orwell points out, quote, in the crucial years, the fact that the party was not a hereditary body did a great deal to neutralize opposition. The older kind of socialist who had been trained to fight against something called class privilege assumed that what is not hereditary cannot be permanent. He did not see that the continuity of an oligarchy need not be physical, nor did he pause to reflect that hereditary aristocracies have always been short-lived, whereas adoptive organizations such as the Catholic Church have sometimes lasted for hundreds or thousands of years, close quote. In addition to my Orwell seminars, I teach a course on ethics of the novel, where I assign 1984 right after A Lesson Before Dying, a novel by the American writer Ernest J. Gaines. Set in Louisiana before the Civil Rights Movement, the latter book deals with a Black man on trial for murder. Although far from guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, he is sentenced to death by an all-white jury. I culminate my discussion of that book by saying, does it make you want to imagine a society without racism? Orwell did. We then go on to compare and contrast the oppression of Black people in the lesson before dying with the oppression of virtually everyone in 1984, with the partial exception of inner party members who have power and some luxuries, but not freedom. In fact, the mandatory, quote, splitting of the intelligence which the party requires of its members is almost universal, but the higher up the ranks one goes, the more marked it becomes. It is precisely in the inner party that war hysteria and hatred of the enemy are stronger, close quote. My teaching of 1984 does not neglect the familiar political aspects of the book. For example, I use this poem that I had in Light Poetry magazine. So, so Putin's revving up the war to make the conflict cease. He's back in 1984 proclaiming war as peace. This talk, however, has explored how a new talk, new approach can open up new perspectives on the book and on one's own life. That's it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm sure that's opened up some fresh thoughts on a book that uh, I'm sure is familiar to everybody tonight. Um, who would like to ask the first question? Well, while you're thinking about that, uh, Felicia Nemo, um, 
the other a, a, another book that perhaps doesn't get the same uh, recognition as 1984 is Sinclair Lewis's It Couldn't Happen Here. Uh, how do you see that in relevance to your contemporary politics in the States? I read that book quite a long time ago. So, um, in fact, the only thing I really remember from it is a sort of perfectly horrible reference to the fact that someone's eyelids had been removed. So I think you're going to need to tell me a little bit more. I gather what it was about from what I do remember was a right-wing takeover. I think that is incredibly unlikely. I think some quite bad things have happened in America, especially with respect to that creature whose name I do not use. But the idea that we could really have a totalitarian takeover strikes me mm. as just, frankly, self-indulgent silliness. Well, uh, what what the book is, the, the dictator builds his uh, uh, ascent to power on is the development of uh, armed militia. Uh, and it's that aspect that I think is um, particularly relevant to what happened um well first of all in virginia and then uh, and then uh, when he said there were some good people on both sides um and then of course with the insurrection at the capitol except of course look at how it ended i was not denying that there were a lot of crackpots in america that there were people who would try to take over the government and that there were people who would do outrageous things i think mm -hmm. it's extremely unlikely that they could succeed they could do a lot of harm, though. They could harm a lot of individuals. They could harm a lot of groups. I'm not saying that bad things can't happen here. Bad things have happened here and are happening here. I'm just saying I think it's incredible that there could be a takeover of that sort. Yeah. There are degrees of evil. Yeah. Any Any questions? Peter, Brian, Barry. <laughs> All three, thank you. Um, Dr. Ackerman, thank you for your talk. Um, appreciate this work and, and much more of your work on Orwell. Um, I have two questions if I can. Um, one is about some of the conditions that you had posted, um, especially condition number three. Um, some of these sound a bit like, I don't know, laws of psychology or something like that. And I think a lot of us are kind of suspicious of such things. Um, I'm also kind of curious why the object of reassessment in the case that plagues both Winston and Julia wouldn't be like me myself rather than my beloved, my failure um, to, to stand up, be strong enough to be able to resist on her behalf. That could still complicate the relationship, of course, um, but it wouldn't change my assessment of my beloved. It would change my assessment of myself. Um, and also, if I can just ask a question about pedagogy, when, when you're teaching Orwell as a philosophy professor, um, I'm curious what kind of philosophy works you teach sort of alongside the novels. Um, I think in particular for 1984, there's going to be places where we have to talk about idealism and, and, and maybe some other metaphysics. Um, and so partly, um, just for my own purposes, kind of having a sense of what you use and what you found instructive when you're teaching this book. Um, again, thanks for your talk, and I'm looking forward to your responses. Thank you very much. Let me take them one by one. When I teach Orwell, I don't teach anything but Orwell. I think you're absolutely right that there are other things that are relevant. The anti-realism of O'Brien, for example, is relevant to various epistemic disputes. But I can't cover everything, and I think Orwell is better than the other people that we teach. Okay, now about your other two questions, I'm taking them in reverse order. I think it's absolutely right that the reason, and this is something I stress, and it's something I think many people get wrong, the reason Orwell, uh, Winston and June's relationship is over is there were things, your own acts, from which you could never recover. Julia says, after you don't care what, you don't give a damn what they suffer, you want it to happen to the other person. After that, you don't feel the same toward the other. The idea is not that they can't trust the other, but that they realize how hollow their own love is, and that means it can't be reinstated. Now, your first question, you said something about condition three, psychology and suspicion. I'm not sure I got exactly what you had in mind. Maybe you can repeat it. Um, 
or was it just what you said? Um, wh why did you mention psychology in this context and how is it relevant? I am quite skeptical of the therapeutic outlook on life too. I think it's really kind of preposterous to suppose that anybody could recover from this and still love the person, but who knows? You know, I, I mean, this is, uh, could you amplify your first objection a bit more? I'm not sure I know just what you had in mind. Yeah, apologies. Let me try to be clear. Um, suppose I'm skeptical that there are psychological laws of nature quite generally. Um, human psychology being as varied and complicated as it is, there's just no necessary consequence um, with respect to how I think or feel given various kinds of inputs. Um, if I'm suspicious that there are anything like psychological laws of nature quite generally, um, then you know, it might be weird, but anything's gain, even given the really awful trauma that, that Julian Winston have gone through. Um, who knows how people are going to react, right? But if, but if that's the case, then it seems like there should be room um, for more affirmative reactions, even in the, even in the face of that trauma. So I, I'm, I'm sort of skeptical about psychological laws of nature generally, and maybe that's mm -hmm. why I'm looking at a condition three. The criticism you're making, I think, is really a criticism of Orwell, because he is representing Winston as every man. Note, however, that um, O'Brien also says men are infinitely malleable. So if that's really true, you can't help wondering why once Winston has gone through this, he couldn't be malleable too. It seems to me that those two claims are really not consistent. I do not have an opinion on the empirical question, how on earth would I know, of whether everybody would react the way Winston would. I do think that, I think it's quite likely I would. I mean, I think it hits home in a psychologically plausible way. There are certainly psychological laws of nature in a cognitive sense, as limits to what human beings can understand and learn. I have no opinion, as I said, about whether there are emotional psychological. That's an empirical question. Uh, oh. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Any any other questions? Uh, yeah, thanks so very much for the uh, a very interesting talk. Uh, I'm curious, the, the list that you began with, uh, you know, uh, uh, how long ago they were done, uh, you know, you, you have this rather provocative title, but do you actually believe by the general re reading public <laughs> that the novel is underrated, uh, particularly uh, nowadays when it's, it's never been uh, never been selling the... Uh, Better. I mean, I've used the title to, uh, you know, a, 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 a challenging title, uh, but do you actually agree with it? Absolutely, because I think the emotional, non political side of it is what I think is underrated. I didn't say I thought the political side was underrated. I think an awful lot of people, and I'm judging this from things I've read, how often when you read a discussion of 1984, do you even hear the issues I mentioned discussed? I'm not saying you never do, but you don't hear them much. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a discussion of 1984 in terms of the issue of physical appearance. I have seen it in terms of the issue of Winston and Julia, but not in these terms. I'm not sure I've ever seen anything, if you know of one, please tell me, that represents their relationship as a tragic love story that has implications, if not for everyone, I think that was a perfectly reasonable objection, for many, many people. So in fact, I think it's underrated as a novel about particular human beings. I think, as I've argued, it may even be a bit overrated as a novel of political prophecy. Mm -hmm. Anybody else with a question or a comment? Mm -hmm. Well, let, mm -hmm. let me ask you something, if no one else is going to ask something. Um, I mentioned before, you know, in one place I read that someone called Coming Up for Air Orwell's Masterpiece. I've heard the claim that Animal Farm was Orwell's best book. I think this is obviously the best book because of its emotional power. And I'm curious how many people agree with me. Just in your assessment, how many people think this is Orwell's greatest novel? Greatest in the sense of deserving the most admiration. Les, uh, unmute, please. I just want to agree that um, 
Animal Farm and Coming Up for Air are both excellent, but probably 1984 is more significant. And and what actually 1984 leads one to do is to read backwards, to read into Coming Up for Air aspects which would later be developed in 1984. So oh, I, th I, th I think that's clearly true. I mean, the idea that, you know, things are really hopeless and so forth. Um, but um, you said of greater significance. What did you actually mean by that? What I'm arguing is it's sort of the best book in a literary sense. It is the most emotional, imaginative power, something like that. Uh, in, many, in many ways, uh, as, as people have said, uh, you know, he was writing it under very um, uh, severe conditions. In, in many ways, it's a slightly crude novel. I mean, I think it's there's no question that 1984 has been it was his most influential novel. Uh, but uh, as a work of art, um, Animal Farm, I think, is uh, superior and possibly coming up with air. And as Rebecca has just said, uh, what about the essays? A, a, a lot of people feel, I think there's a considerable thought, that Orwell's greatest writings are, 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 the, are the major essays, which have actually have been tremendously uh, are both powerful and wonderful, and also have been uh, tremendously influential. I don't know how valuable it is to, to make a list of, of, of uh, you know, to do a hierarchy. Uh, of course, these books are so different in so many ways uh, that, that uh, to, to say which is more influential, which is better, I, I, I'm not quite sure that's quite the the best way to approach it all. I find that question interesting largely because I think there's a huge gap. If it were a matter of a small gap, it would be less interesting. Also, it's interesting to contemplate because thinking about that makes you see the different ways in which they they may or may not be better and enables you to get a better idea of how to compare and contrast them. But I want to ask you something else. What exactly do you think is crude in 1984? Now, I will admit there are some things. I already called attention to one inconsistency, the idea both that Winston is supposed to be it's supposed to represent everyone's fate and that the love is supposed to be, the change is supposed to be irrevocable. And against that, the idea that uh, men are infinitely malleable. Also, and I think I mentioned this at an earlier meeting, there's that scene where Julia gives Winston incredibly detailed directions and he remembers them. I think if Orwell had thought it over, he wouldn't have made them quite so detailed if Winston is supposed to be every man. But beyond that, how do you think the book is crude? Say, well, you know, I, I don't think I'm not enough of a literary uh, critic, but but, and I know what others think, but in, in a way, Winston and Julia. Well, what can one say? Yeah, I think there there are elements that they're somewhat two dimensional characters. Um, in a way, I don't think. Uh, 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 well, I don't know what others think. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I think it's an incredibly powerful novel, but 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 it's not. Um, how can one put it? I don't. I don't think it's a great literary work. Uh, that that's not necessarily a criticism. I don't think it's an elegant. I don't think it's an elegant novel, <clears throat> and that's not necessarily a criticism. Uh, uh, but but um, I think, as I say, the essays, of course, I think quite a few people will feel it's not necessarily, it's his most influential book, obviously, uh, but a lot of people would not feel that it was his greatest writing, I think. I don't know what others think. I'd really like to know more about why you think Winston and Julia are mm -hmm. two-dimensional. That is, what is lacking? I feel that I know them as well as I know anybody I've ever encountered in fiction and probably better than I know a lot of people in real life. After all, you don't know people. I don't think I can go into detail. I wonder what others think. I think they're interesting characters. I think they're fine. Uh, I, but I, I don't think that they're, in the literary sense, I don't think they're the best written about characters in 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 world literature. 
I I wouldn't mind jumping in if I may. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Just to say that I think Orwell is doing something really different in 1984. He's writing something that's not as abstract a fable as Animal Farm, but it's not the bourgeois realist novel that his earlier novels are. So he's not going into character with the same depth that he might in coming up for air character and experience and biographical detail. We do learn compelling things about Julia and Winston. And I love the talk, which has made me think more about them. But it's a relatively brief dossier on who they are compared to a lot of characters in a lot of English novels of the era, including some of Orwell's. And I just want to throw in a footnote while I've got the floor, which is to say, we now know of a lot of couples who have been tortured in the Soviet Union, in Chile and Argentina during the dictatorships in other parts of the world. And I wonder if at some point somebody has done research to see if the outcome of Julia's and Winston's torture is accurate to what the evidence of actually tortured couples um, suggests. But I don't want to derail the conversation about the caliber of 1984 and Orwell's intent in writing it. I'm not commenting on Orwell's intent at all. I'm just commenting on how the novel comes across. And I guess we just simply disagree. I think Winston and Julia are as well-developed as characters could be. I do think, however, your remark about torture is very interesting. And I want to mention something which I bet many of you know more about than I do. Apparently, I've read about this, and I think it really happened. I think there's a Yael Diana novel based on this. Nazis would say to a mother with two Jew Jewish children, tell me which one to save. And then, as you can probably guess, they saved the other one. So the woman and the child she rejected had to live with that knowledge for the rest of their lives. I don't know anything about how this turned out in practice, but this is something I've heard of. I wonder, does anybody know anything more about this than I do? I've encountered this only in fiction. Well, my my guess would be that they were all killed in those circumstances. I don't I don't think there was too much charity around. I um uh, if this is really true, it's both in um David called Death Has Two Sons, I'm not sure. And also a, a really schlocky novel called The Conversion of Chapel and Cohen by Herbert Tarr, which used this situation. The idea was presumably that this was the worst sort of torture, although, of course, it's not worse than being killed, that they'd have to live with this knowledge of betrayal. Of course, the novel Beloved is about a woman who killed one of her enslaved children rather than see what would happen to her and is haunted by the ghost. But it sounds like you're describing William Styron's Sophie's Choice, where a woman's haunted by the choice she was forced to make between her children. Oh, thank you for that. Um, I don't think I saw the movie, but I am aware that that sort of thing happened. In <laughs> another fictional example. I have not read Beloved. I've read other Morrison novels, but when I started that one, I simply wasn't gripped. I've read Tar Baby and Sula. Um, Orwell himself did say that he'd ballsed up. I, th uh, I think he used that phrase in a letter to Julian Simmons, the uh, the Room 101 section. So he was admitting that there were some failures in uh, in the end of the novel. But then, of course, there's the final redemption scene in which everything is reversed and in which in which Winston loves Big Brother. Um, so, you know, uh, what was the phrase that Orwell used in his letter to Julian Simmons? Um, if he hadn't been so ill, he would have written it better. Um, but nevertheless, it probably indicates his intention of what he wanted to do. Another interesting oddity about the book, and I'll bet you anything, I'm not the first person who's mentioned this, is um, the appendix and also Simon, his conversation with Winston makes it sound as though once Newspeak is has been taken over, any other type of thought will be impossible. But there's an obvious objection to that. How did language evolve to begin with? I mean, presumably the same thing could happen. It would happen very slowly, presumably. But it's not as though language didn't once 
with its complex political thoughts evolve from scratch. The proof of that, I would suggest, is that uh, we don't all speak one language across the world. <laughs> and people express those sorts of thoughts in all sorts of languages. So uh, 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 I, would, uh, I would go with that argument. But presumably you couldn't express it in Newspeak precisely because it's been restricted in that way. Mm. Are there any fresh lines of debate? Yeah. Yes. Friend. Yes, we. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, uh, uh, Lucia. Can I just uh, go back to what you were saying? Mm. What do you think was the uh, all world's best book? 1984, I quite agree, was not the, the world's greatest uh, book in terms of its. Uh, uh, its ability to to it, it put forward, uh, uh, I suppose, questions which have been uh, going around the world for for decades and decades and decades, in in terms of it, it's caused huge amounts of debate. Uh, Animal Farm was a much more complete book. It was it was a delightful book. It was it was also. Uh, helped by Eileen, his, his wife at the time, to, to make it thus. But nevertheless, 1984, for all its faults, has created huge amounts of debate throughout the world for decades and decades and decades. And I think um, I, would, I would agree, it's, it's not the greatest um, piece of writing that um, was, was ever produced, but nevertheless, it has a great deal to offer. Um, excuse me, uh, Jason Crimp, I see a very nice dog. Could you display him a little more closely? Maybe we could have a screen where we could see him enlarged on the screen. If anyone has a cat, that would be, pardon me, Jason Crimp, even better. Um, what a nice dog. Thank you very much. What kind of dog is it? It's not my dog. What type of dog is it? It's a Pumi, apparently. It's a Hungarian. It's a Hungarian breed. It's our friend's dog, and we're in our friend's house at the well, moment. Thank you, very, thank you very much. No one has a cat with him? No cats, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvia, please, your question. So, <clears throat> just to add to what Richard said, um, of course, 1984 is the novel that Orwell did not have Eileen around to help edit and perhaps develop the characters a bit more uh, completely. And um, coming up for air, of course, and, and the few before that, she <clears throat> was a very good editor and uh, a, an expert in character and psychology. So I just wanted to suggest that could be part of the reason the characters aren't developed as well as some of us believe. <clears throat> I think I may be a bit more in line with the man who said he was a bit skeptical of psychology sorts of generalizations about human nature. So I would wonder whether that would really be a lack. Let me ask everyone something, though. I mentioned it passing that I did not know of any other discussions of Orwell that discussed the attitudes toward physical appearance manifested in 1984. Is there anybody here who does? No, I think you've got us there. I don't, that, 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 that's what I said when I, when I summed up before asking for questions. That there were some different insights that I'm sure we hadn't had before. I also don't think I've ever seen much discussion of the fact that in supposedly the worst society imaginable, there is no racism. That's entirely plausible. Racism automatically makes a society bad, but its absence doesn't automatically make a society good. Well, I think you, you've silenced everybody now. <laughs> That's been a very interesting discussion. And uh, uh, thank you very much indeed for this, Ian, for thank you. I enjoyed stimulating this. all that conversation. Uh, ne next month, our talk is on the 19th of November. Um, 
one of the things that understandably we're we're keen on is continuing to attract younger members so that the society uh has longevity and 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 the future one of one of those young, younger members is um Quincy de Vries a young canadian who won one of our journalism awards in 2022 uh her her work involves uh working in a um, I presume it's an advertising agency of some sort in toronto where uh she creates podcasts for their clients and what she's proposed and what she's going to talk about is creating a sequence of of uh of podcasts on different aspects of all world studies um and she's going to explain all that to us next month <laughs> and uh, i hope you can all all join us for that may um, i say something i'm oh, sorry my yeah. usual thing I mean, I'm really looking forward to the talk, and I'll be there. But older members are just old. Not older members are just as valuable as younger members. After oh, all, yeah, yeah, well, the, American a, the American AARP has only old people, and it's one of the most thriving organizations there is. So yeah. I'm members of all ages equally. But I am looking forward to that. Well, yeah, yes, indeed. And they don't come much older than me, but uh, uh, we still need to attract. I'm 76. I bet I'm older. Younger than members. Older. However, be that as it may, um, thank you, thank you all very much. Can you all unmute and thank Lucia Nimu in in the usual way? Thank you very much for these interesting questions. Have a great time. Thank you very much, and congratulations, Peter. You're well deserved first winner. Thank, thank you, you so much, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Bye now. Bye. Uh, good, uh, Bye. 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 Bye.